Thank you, everybody, for coming, and it's wonderful to be home. So, what good are dinosaurs anyway? Have any of you guys ever asked that question? Why should my tax dollars go to pay to study an animal that no human being's ever seen? Isn't there more important things to study? How can dinosaurs possibly be relevant to the massive problems we face today? These are legitimate, valid questions that I've heard often in my 20 plus years as a paleontologist. And they've caused me to think long and hard about how the big beasts that fascinate me can shed light on issues that we face in our human dominated world. So why study the distant past? Because it's an experiment that's already been run. The data are there just waiting for us to collect them. If we want to make predictions or model the future, all we have is the past. And except for this tiny little bit of period of time that humans have been on the surface of the planet, all of the data are locked in the rock record. If we want to study climate change, all we have is the past. And when we look to the past, what we see is change is the norm in our planet, not the exception. And when we look at the values in the past, they dwarf, they dwarf our current values and our current concerns. But is there a human overprint? We can't know that unless we study the rocks in the past before there was a time when humans existed. By comparing the two, maybe we can tell if this event is different. If we want to know how organisms change over time, all we have are their fossils, how they're related to each other and how they're related to us. All the records say the fossils, the fossils are what contain that information. After all, almost all of the organisms that ever lived on the surface of the planet are extinct. And without their fossils, we wouldn't know of their existence. How did life begin? How did it change? How did it increase in complexity? And what were the triggers for this? Only the fossils can tell us. When we look to the past in our planet, we see five major extinction events that wiped out almost all the life at that time. When we look at the rocks in which the fossils are interred, what we see are reasons why organisms died out. They existed up to a point in time, and then they vanished globally. Volcanism, plate tectonics, extraterrestrial impacts, the rocks record this. And this is pretty important, because some data suggests that right now we're entering into a sixth global extinction event. But is this event truly different than what we've seen in the past? Or is it only seeming to be different because we're here to, to watch, to recognize? Only the rocks will tell. But why study dinosaurs in particular? Well, by any stretch of the imagination, dinosaurs are enormously successful. They are more widely distributed than mammals, and they still dominate the planet. There are over 10,000 species of birds that are recognized currently, only 5,000 of mammals. Longevity, dinosaurs have ruled the world as a dominant terrestrial organism for over 200 million years. Mammals, they've only dominated for about the last 50 million, and humans, 200,000. Dinosaurs have a speed. They represent the extremes that are possible for terrestrial organisms. Some of the biggest organisms to ever walk the surface of the planet, dinosaurs, and also some of the smallest. Dinosaurs achieve things mammals have never, have never attained. They have the best food processing abilities ever. This dinosaur had up to 2,000 teeth in its mouth at any one period in time, and those teeth continually replaced each other as they wore out, so there was no need for dinosaur dentists. Dinosaurs invented feathers, which begs the question, why feathers? Why not hair? Hair works really good for mammals, and feathers are metabolically expensive. And dinosaurs tried out other things, too. We found fossils of this little flying dinosaur that had not just two feathered wings, but four. And we still don't know how it flew, but we would not know of its existence without the fossils. I would argue there's another equally important reason to study dinosaurs, and it's this. We are becoming increasingly dependent on science and technology, but seeing fewer and fewer young people opt for the scientific disciplines as a career. But dinosaurs are a gateway drug. <laughs> they illustrate the possibilities, they illustrate the process of science. You observe, you predict, 
You gather data, you test. And what we learn from studying dinosaurs can be applied to other sciences as well. It's pretty important. It worked for me. When I was five years old, my big brother left for college on the East Coast, but not before teaching me how to read. And to continue this habit that he started in me, he used to send me books from the big East Coast museums. And my favorite book to this day is The Enormous Egg. And it tells the story that I related to so well about this little farm kid and his favorite chicken. He walked in one morning, and this little chicken was trying to brood an egg that was three times its size. And when that egg finally hatched, out popped a triceratops. And trust me, I've gathered eggs for my aunt, and I'd much rather run into a dinosaur than some of those chickens. <laughs> but what about my own specialty? Why study ancient molecules? It's risky, and it's very expensive, and there's a lot of people who say, we'll never get molecules out of dinosaurs. But we have. Not only molecules, but we've gotten tissues and cells from more than one fossil organism. So what can those molecules tell us? Well, if with further study, they can tell us more about evolutionary relationships than we can ever learn from the bones themselves. But more importantly, we can learn how these animals adapted at the molecular level to their own problems. Changes in environment, varying CO2 levels, introduction of new diseases. The dinosaurs faced all these too, and they succeeded. So we have a lot to learn from them. And as a matter of fact, some organisms that are alive today are in danger of extinction because in the past they went through a bottleneck event, greatly reducing their genetic diversity and the ability to adapt to change. But if we could find molecules in the fossils of these organisms before they went through this bottleneck event, we would get an idea of the original genetic diversity in those populations, and we might be able to use this information in conservation efforts and also learn what made them vulnerable while other organisms aren't. Um, looking for molecules and fossils has already resulted in advancements in comparative databases, advancements in technology, increasing sensitivity. Um, and so just the, the process of it has resulted in this. Um, I can suggest that we have a transparent, flexible polymer. There's got to be a use for that in biomaterial science when it lasts 80 million years. And there's even, when we study the interactions between molecules and their environments, we can learn information about human diseases, which in many cases are the result of modified molecules. Even bioterrorism, what I do is look for small, low concentration molecules that are heavily modified in a sedimentary environment. And it requires really sensitive instrumentation to do so. That's what we need when we, study for, uh, when we look for bioterrorist agents. They're highly modified, they're low in concentration, and they cause a lot of problems. The same skill set is required. So I can make all roads lead to dinosaurs. And to think that for me, it all began with a children's book. And the professor is talking to the little boy when he comes to study that triceratops. And he says, a scientist doesn't know all the answers. Nobody does. Not even teachers. They used to think highly of teachers back then. But a scientist keeps on trying to find the answers. And just remember, when you're talking about frontiers, maybe the next frontier lies in the past. Thank you.